Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. And today we are going to recreate another one of my favorite paintings. Today we're going to be looking at the work of Edvard Munch. And we're going to be doing two versions of the five versions of the scream that he did uh, beginning in 1893. We're going to do one of the pastel versions and one of the uh, oil painting versions in acrylic paint. So we've got uh, a few things I want to accomplish today and uh, a chance to explore arguably the most famous painting in modern art history. It's about time we tackle this one, so let's get right to it. The plan for today is we're going to um, get our images onto the canvases or canvi, uh, and then we're going to stain them with some color. We're going to talk about Edvard Munch's biography while we work on, um, uh, while we let those dry. Underpainting, not sure if I want to do underpainting. Let's see. Um, and then we're going to do background, foreground, background, foreground. And I've got to be done by three, which is in four hours. Really? Okay, so let's we're, let's get on this horse and ride. Okay, so um, the the plan for today is, or sorry, if you want to support the channel, <laughs> uh, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Um, you can comment on videos, comment on previous videos after they've aired. That always helps as well. And if you want to support the channel with a small donation, you can use PayPal, the YouTube Super Chat while we're here live, um, or contact me via email. My email's on, my f on the Facebook group and on my website. And um, uh, all of those links are down in the description below. So... Um, all sorts of technical problems this morning so I'm all discombobulated which makes sense for a painting like this <laughs> um, so let's uh, let's get right to it here The first thing we want to do is we want to get an image onto the canvas. And I'll show you where you can download a free template for both of the artworks that we're going to be doing today. Um, there's links in the description below. And so click on the, the link down below for Dropbox Outline Folder. And it'll take you to a screen a little bit like this. In it, you'll see... Uh, our basic materials for getting started with acrylic painting, painting the color wheel and buying paint. And then the next 50 folders here or so that begin with uh, zero, zero, um, and then an, a letter are um, more basic paintings. I've got to come up with a better system. But this is the best, this is the one we got right now. <laughs> and then uh, the next 100 and almost 200 folders are for slightly more complex paintings. And where are we? We are, okay, right here, 130. <laughs> Click on that, and you'll see that there are six files in here. There's the, both of the original paintings, and then my outlines that I did on, the, on my iPad Pro using the Procreate app. You see there's a JPEG version and a PDF version. So you can download and print them both out, whichever ones you want to do, and uh, whichever file format prints easier on your home inkjet, laser jet printer, your printer at work, or your the copy shop down the street, etc. So we download that, and let's just see. So you'll have your original of the painting from 1893 and the outline for it. And then the pastel that he did, uh, this should actually read 1895, um, which sold for $112 million just a, a decade ago. And at one for a short period of time was the most expensive artwork ever sold. And the outline that I did for that um, 
So you've got your two outlines and you can see that they're similar, but different paintings. That's the one that was done uh, originally in 1893. Not the first version. There was another pastel that preceded it. We'll get into it. And then this one, and then there's also a painting done in 1910 as well. So let's, um, let's go now. Which one do I want to start with? Let's do the drawing for the pastel first. Uh, okay, let me think. Okay. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna um, do two things. I'm gonna do one version of this drawing on a, a canvas board a nine by 12 sized canvas board. Now this one is right out of the plastic. I didn't gesso it. Uh, just so we can see the, the, the texture of this surface uh, in comparison to one that is has been gessoed a second time. I just figure why not keep things interesting for no particular reason. <laughs> Let's, uh, I'm gonna tape this down while we're here as well. Uh, yeah, let's give it a little more sky. Okay, and so once I've got both of these taped down onto canvas panels here, I don't know if that's going to drive me crazy later that they're not oriented the same. <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to align this one. I'll probably use a ruler later on just to make sure that that's relatively straight. Okay. So now I'm going to use some carbon transfer paper, or technically this is actually graphite transfer paper, and um, I've just been using this old folder that I got at like a local dollar store, And but I ordered a sh this package of 100 se sheets of graphite paper off of Amazon, and I've used, I think I ordered that maybe two years ago, I think I've used about 10 sheets, because this is one of them. You can use them over and over and over again. So I guess I'll start with the painting here. Now with both of these paintings, or well, with both of these artworks, one being a pastel and one being an oil painting, I'm not at all concerned with getting the... Uh, um, <clears throat> all of these lines, particularly those in the sky here, in quote unquote the right place. So I'm just going to sort of do every third or so line. So I did them a little bit more lightly because one of the things that we'll see with Monk's paintings <clears throat> is that he often painted with fairly thin paint. Well, sometimes, well, sometimes he did. Sometimes he painted with actually very thick paint. And so that's... Um, he really liked to kind of play with his materials and to try to do maybe a few different things each time around. Now you'll notice there's on the painting, well, we'll talk about this probably a few times, 
but there's this one part of the railing which doesn't seem to quite connect there. I think that's... Well, I think it's just a mistake, but... It doesn't mean that... Uh, he... You know, I think you, when you're doing anything like this, it's very easy to to get a little confused. So I think that's probably who's just a little overwhelmed with all of these stripes. And maybe once he got into the, he may even have realized what he had done at some point. Was just like, yeah, whatever. It's good enough for government work, as my grandfather used to say. Now I could hand draw all of these lines, um, but I'm just going to hand paint them later. I'm not going to use tape, but this is actually probably arguably faster than trying to draw these lines as steady as possible. Well, we'll fix that. We'll fix that later. That's probably good enough, right? We can just imagine the rest. All of those lines in the hill, I think, are not important. Signature. Do a little bit later. Enough. <laughs> Get all the folks in the chat there. There's Deborah and Barbara and Lolly and Ismo, the Neapolitan Mastiff, <laughs> and uh, Lisa and Senga and Christina and Pascaline. Wow, okay, awesome. Now, 
I'm gonna do the outline for this one here, but now that I'm realizing I got four hours to do all this, I will see if I actually do this painting. Do the outline so that I've got it ready. I did notice that some of these lines of his um, are a little crooked. So I did kind of straighten them a little bit out, which probably tells you a little bit more about me than him. But just for the sake of convenience, trying to, to get them all to be as wonky as they might have already, they were originally done, could just cause people unneeded stress, so. Okay, I was going to do one on paper, but I think... On canvas, just to keep things brief, and I may wait till the end of the episode to tackle this pastel one so that if I run out of time, I can always do it again in a different video. One thing when it comes to Edvard Munch and the way that he drew and painted is he he would go over his lines many times. And so if that's you, you've probably found your your kindred spirit here with Munch. Let's get some of the big sweeping lines across here. Clear some space now.
The main difference between these two compositions are this red stripe on the side and the figures in the background. I guess also one is missing a boat versus... Uh, so just, there are little differences here, but um, they are mostly similar. Okay, so... Let's move to the next step. So what we're going to do next is we're... Oops. So what we're going to do next is we're going to apply some color onto both of these pictures, I think. And um, this technique is called the imprimatur. It's an Italian word for the priming layer. And it was really popularized during the Renaissance. This was a very typical thing for artists to do, especially those who were, well, really primarily those that were starting to paint onto canvas, which at the time was a new material. Previously, artists had painted on walls, which were frescoes, or on panels, like wooden panels, like plywood. Um, and canvas was an alternative which was seen to be a little bit more stable because it, uh, you know, if wood warps, it cracks, and that can be a problem. So artists started painting on stretched fabric over a frame. And um, so the 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 way that I'm going to paint this is with a technique or a, a palette called the split primary palette. That means I'm take, I basically can do all of the colors that we can see, about 95% of them, using just eight tubes of paint. And really, I, don't, I very rarely use my black paint. So we really just need these seven tubes. Two yellows, two reds, two blues, and a white. And that's because I've taken the primary colors, split them in half, so now that into their cool and warm components. Now the brand that I like to use, mostly just because it's the, the cheapest um, and highest quality, the best bang for the buck, are these Amsterdam paints. And I'm about to use this warm yellow for my Impone Matura, as opposed to mixing a brown, which would be more traditional. I'm not sponsored, not paid a penny by any company at all. I've gone and bought the paint just like you. Uh, and so this is my recommendation. I've been doing it for over three years and they, they seem to get pretty good results. So um, this is my recommendation for our background color. Now I'm just gonna flip through all, a bunch, pretty much if all the other brands of paint. And if you see yours, you can always pause the screen, go back. Uh, or look in the Dropbox folder for the handout that uh, lists all these paints. Oh my goodness, look at all you guys having quite the conversation in the chat there. Heidi says I was signed in and I can chat. I was blocked out a few times. Oh my goodness. Senga says no ink left in the printer, so I just had to draw it out. Well, this is one of the, the easier ones to draw, for sure. Okay, and so what you're seeing on the screen are two brands that I do not recommend, at least for what we're doing here. Because um, both Peebo and Museum Color mix a larger quantity of titanium white into all of the colors in, an, in a quantity that I think is excessive and unnecessary. And they're doing that as a, um, as a filler. And it just means that we can't mix a true black or a black that, that as I like to make, mix it. Um, it also means that all the colors are gonna be slightly um, dull because whenever we add white to a color, it tints the color. And when a color is tinted, it is a little bit more pastel, right? And so if you like pastels, go and get your Peebo. You're going to love them. If you, or the museum color, it's even cheaper. And some of the other brands might also do the same thing as well. But I haven't used every brand of paint out there. So um, uh, I can't vouch for what works and what doesn't. But those are the, all of those previous slides you saw uh, intend to give you an idea of what I would do if I had those brands, or those are the only ones available to me. And if you do run into problems, please, um, 
uh, let me know so that I can let other people know. If you're unable to mix colors as I do with one or the other brands. Um, so there's my warm yellow. I'm just going to apply some paint on my palette right now. And then I do have a couple tubes of black paint that have been sticking around here in this box for three years now, and they're still half full, um, because I like to mix my own black, as you probably know. Okay. So, I'll move that to the side. Now, these generally are undesirable, but I like to um, save them. <laughs> I've got a little stack of these things, because if I do make a painting where there's a lot of texture, rather than just using a bunch of paint um, that I might otherwise want to use, here's paint that it was is technically garbage, that I can cut up and mix into paint as a filler. And um, and that way I'm not wasting paint that I do want to use. And also, if I, if I want to make a lot of texture with paint, um, obviously I can use like a, a wax or, or a, a medium a thickening agent, which I've done in the past. But that can take a long time to dry. Whereas this is already dry, so I can cut it up, mix it into the paint. And then therefore the paint itself doesn't... There's much less paint that needs to dry. The... the, the stuff on the inside is mostly dry. So, uh, okay. So, I'm going to add some water to this paint. This is the only time I ever use water uh, with acrylic paint. No law saying you can't do it, but uh, this is really the only time that's technically where it's maybe beneficial to use it because it's going to absorb very quickly into the canvas which is uh, at this moment just coated with gesso and gesso is basically acrylic, clear acrylic with um, white plaster powder in it. Sometimes there's a little bit of pigment as well um, but it uh, you know, it's going to absorb water really well and dry very quickly. Again, after all, the, the, I'm technically staining this surface, which is um, different than painting. Because paint, you generally want to sit on the surface of whatever kind of support, whether it be canvas or wood or glass or, or aluminum or whatever you're painting on, versus a stain is intended to be absorbed into the material, the, the paper, the fabric, etc. Um, so one could, could suggest maybe that a a wash in watercolor painting is a kind of a stain. Watercolor is such a enigmatic material. It's sort of like halfway between painting and, and staining a surface, which is probably why I find it to be such a um, uh, difficult material to work with. Looks like I'll 
just barely enough to get this second canvas. Now, even though this is a drawing or pastel drawing on paper, I'm still going to kind of build it up in the same way that I typically do. Just because it's a, a habit of mine. And... I think it's a good habit of mine. I think every artist has certain kind of studio habits. Just like, you know, maybe a hockey player has a certain way of lacing up their skates that they've been doing every time they go play hockey for the past, since they were five years old or the same way that a you know um, a ballerina might put on one slipper before the other and um, or you know a lawyer might you know wear certain socks on the big day of the trial or whatever it might be you know we all have little things that we do that kind of help uh, just get us into a particular frame of mind, and you can call it superstition, for sure. Um, but, you know, whatever works, right, I'm all for that. If it works, keep doing it. If it's not working, don't do it. Uh, Axley says, hello, I came from your drawing course and was about to watch episode 5 of it and saw that you're live. I just wanted to take the chance to say thanks very much. <laughs> thanks, Axley. That's very cool. Awesome. Well, good luck on the drawings. Keep us posted. Join the Facebook group. We'd love to see what you're up to and how your progress goes. Awesome. I love that that class just keeps on going all these years later. Just keeps building more and more momentum, more and more people around the world learning how to draw. <laughs> and Barbara, I love that. Don't forget to like and subscribe. You're awesome. I love that. Okay. Um, let's... I think I want to have both of these in front of me. I may have mentioned that I'm in a a big um, Mary Kondo cleaning spree at the moment, and so just everything around me is in a bit of a disaster state. It's getting better, better, but it's just uh, uh, as she says, it gets it gets worse before it gets better. Um, so I'm up to my knees and things. But it's so satisfying taking bags of things to the Salvation Army and getting them out of the house. Okay. Uh, let's get set up. And I'm currently just starting on my studio here, so that's... I feel particularly discombobulated. Okay. So let's take a few minutes here to talk a little bit about Edvard Munch and his biography and maybe more specifically these artworks, as the, the Scream series of artworks that he did. Um, I'm a huge Edvard Munch fan, so this certainly won't be the last episode we do focusing on his work. So I will, keeping that in mind, we'll, we'll really try to stay pretty close to just the uh, the screen. So, yeah. 
because there's some artworks before this and after this that he did that I also want to do. Um, so here's our Facebook page. I encourage you to join the Facebook page. Uh, next Thursday, I think it is. So I think this time next Thursday, we're going to do another feedback episode. I put the thumbnail up here on YouTube so you can hit the notification bell for that. Um, and anything that's on here, we're really going to focus primarily on some paintings that you've done in class and the drawings that uh, you've also done over the past few months so that we can catch up completely and everything will be, will be back to square one on all of that. Okay. Uh, so, Edvard Munch. What an interesting fellow. <laughs> so, Edvard Munch is born north of Oslo, Norway in this um, Adelbrook, Adelsbrook, which is gosh, I don't know how, you know, would have been a good couple days journey north of Oslo. Um, you can see here's the, the capital Oslo of Norway. And you can see Norway and their brother Sweden. And so as we zoom out, you can see the, the relationship here between Norway and um, and the rest of Europe and North Africa there, right? Um, so you can also see that he's growing up in a fairly isolated village um, in Norway. And I think that plays a little bit of a... Um, a role in his his interest in landscape later on, um, but also feelings that he has throughout his life of being isolated and alone, paranoid and um, um, and also dealing with alcoholism. In if there's a, a family history of alcoholism, which is you know sometimes common in northern climates. Same thing here in in Canada right because sometimes there's not a lot else to do during those cold winter months okay so Edvard Munch is born in 1863 in Adelsbrook Norway north of Oslo and lives till the age of 80 uh, when he passes away towards the end of World War II in 1944 <coughs> excuse me that snuck up on me quick <laughs> And there is some debate as to maybe how or he died, although he was at age 80 when he passed away. There is some suspicion as to what exactly went on down there, which we'll talk about briefly. Uh, so, um, where should we start? Uh, so, Edvard Munch, uh, his father was a priest, and... Um, uh, also had some difficulties with, with alcohol, um, and despite the, the religious upbringing, um, there was a, a family history of, of, uh, mental and physical illness, uh, and, um, and as Munkim said, a, uh, um, a familiar, familial history of insanity as he put it um so both you know both of his um uh, well his mother passes away when um he is a teen let me see when does that uh his mother dies in 1868 so he's oh he's five years old so he's five years old when his mother passes away of tuberculo tuberculosis and then a few years or a decade later, his sister um, Sophie, Johann Sophie, um, dies as well. So basically, so let me start that over. So at age five, Edvard Munch's mother passes away from tuberculosis. And then a decade later, his his sister, his, 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 he comes from a family of five children. Uh, he's the second oldest. His, his older sister passes away also of uh, tuberculosis, I believe. 
and her death is is a, is a little bit um, longer and more and there, therefore almost more painful both to uh, his sister but also to the family there's a, it's quite a traumatic experience she's uh, kind of laying in bed for months slowly um, um, uh, uh, sick dying getting more and more sickly which we'll see is is documented much maybe I'll just point out here in a famous painting that is now um, well, he did a version of this that's in the Tate Gallery uh, in London, England. And so documenting the, the, the slow death of his sister here. And so that was quite traumatic, having his mother, whom he was quite close to, probably closer to than his father, who was kind of a bit of a stern fellow. So um, uh, those were very traumatic moments. Uh, and very powerful moments in the history of the young man. Uh, later on in in his life, his sister um, Laura is uh, diagnosed with some mental illness and is eventually uh, sent to a mental institution or an asylum, as they were called. Uh, and his younger brother also died a couple days after his wedding. So there's all of this like death in the family and uh, Edward Munch's, uh, you know, he's raised primarily by his father and his aunt and, um, you know, he's got his, his younger sister shows potentially some kind of mental illness, his, his older sister who sort of taken care of him after his mother dies has di now died as well and soon enough Edward Munk himself falls ill he's and he is kind of in and out of hospital and um, one of the things he does as we've seen with a lot of artists you notice this is an ongoing theme of artists getting sick when they're young and taking up drawing as a um, as a way of uh, of keeping busy during those long periods of convalescence and so Edward Munk, like many of those other artists, starts to draw. Uh, he also becomes a big fan of, um, of uh, authors like Edgar Allan Poe and reading ghost stories. And so you can kind of, when you see Edward Munch's work, as we'll do here shortly, there is this kind of, kind of these darker themes that seem to emerge and... Um, Kind of these gothic horror uh, things are are you know even happy paintings seem to be kind of more melancholic. There's an ambiguity as to maybe what people are feeling and thinking, and so I think it comes comes back down to these uh, macabre inter interests and the the family situation, the, the trauma that he endured growing up. I mean, it's also believed that Edward Munch himself was suffering from mental illness throughout his life and uh, has been sort of, you know, uh, posthumously diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Um, uh, so, you know, obviously he was struggling himself like everyone else in his family. Um, he, let's see, let's, let me just get the dates, 63, so... What about age 17, he enrolls at the Royal School of Art and Design in Christiana, which we now know as Oslo. And um, while he's there, he's he studies sort of the... Uh, he studies maybe some of the more traditional approaches, more academic approaches to painting. But one of the, the, the uh, genre or movements that is kind of taking over Europe at the time is Impressionism. So Edward Munch tries Impressionism, he tries the more um, academic approaches to painting, and he kind of finds both of them to be relatively... Um, I can't remember the, the word he uses, but but he feels that they're, they're very surface level that they don't go deep enough, they don't express feeling and emotion in the way that he believes art should. And, uh, you know, I, 
posted it on the Facebook group. I don't know if I'll be able to find it here. Let me see. I think. Um, so he says, um, he's quoted as saying, or writing actually, I do not believe in the art which is not the compulsive result of man's urge to open his heart. Oh, by the way, every episode I write a little, or a lot, <laughs> biographical history there. So you can see right from that outset, he's like at a relatively young age and, and during the time when he's in art school in his late teens, early 20s, he looks at the art going on around him and is like, this doesn't really express deep emotion. It doesn't express what's going on in the heart. Like he looks at Im impressionist paintings because there's a lot of impressionist or, or artists who in Norway, in Oslo, who get into Impressionism, because it's sort of, it's very much like the, a reaction to academic painting, the prevailing um, style uh, of, of art that was being taught in the school. So whenever he's going around to art galleries around town, he's seeing a lot of Impressionist work. Even some of his teachers were exploring Impressionism. But he looks at it as like, oh, it's like, you know, people sitting on the shore of the river having wine and laughing and out on the boats and, you know, it's like people picking flowers in their gardens and you're th again thinking at this time, this is, you know, the heyday of the Industrial Revolution. Things are changing. Buildings are going up all over the place that are, people are moving to the city. There's smokestacks and trains and, um... Uh, uh, kind of a uh, both a uh, burgeoning uh, middle class, but also more and more people who find themselves falling out of um, uh, of the mainstream, who are becoming homeless or struggling with poverty, and um, people a lot of uh, alcoholism in his own family. And also that he sees in his the teachers at school and amongst his friends and himself. And so he kind of feels like that beautiful side of Impressionism isn't really expressing the world that he sees around him. And he thinks art should go deeper. It should be more um, personal and less objective. Right, it 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 should be, you know, um, talking about and focused on issues that are deeply meaningful to the artists themselves. I know that, and you know, to us today, that seems kind of like not a big deal. Like what, making art about things you're interested in? Why is that at all revolutionary? That's, but. Again, if we go back in time, 100, 150 years, artists are, are have now kind of been are, uh, pulled away from the 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 millennia of millennial like the thousands of years of tradition of making work for pure, primarily for churches and kings and queens, right? And now. Um, they're, they're even less likely to be doing commissions for this rich, wealthy middle class and now just painting whatever they want to paint, putting it out into the world and hoping somebody will buy that painting, right? So that is, that's, that's all happening in this, the, the, the kind of basically the generation before Munch and, and comes to a major head with Munch's uh, generation itself, right? Where now artists... You know, just look at a canvas and like, what am I going to paint today? I don't know. There's nobody telling me what to do. Uh, there's nobody telling me, um, you know, what size and color and what themes. It's all coming from inside. And so Edvard Munch looks at the Impressionists who, who, were, ha who had some of that freedom. But he looks at it and he's like, this seems so superficial. Like, like, what are they really saying? Like, this just seems like vacation portraits kind of thing. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily all or what the Impressionists were doing, but from the look of, you know, a 19-year-old art student 
that was precisely what was sort of going on in those works. All right, you know, like, I mean, I was a young person myself, and young people tend to have um, uh, maybe slightly less nuanced views of the world, um, and maybe a little bit very um, passionate and reactionary kind of... Uh, um, uh, feelings, ideas, uh, which is all generally perhaps a good thing, <laughs> uh, can help make for, for great change in society, um, generally for the better, right? Uh, so there are here, well, let's, let's actually explore some of his works here. Let me see. Okay. Um, so you can see some of these paintings he's doing in the early 1880s. So this is around the time when he first goes to art school in Oslo. You see that the color palettes are, there's a lot of browns, a lot of blacks, um, which is very typical of, of academic painting, right? I mean, many of these paintings kind of have a... Um, you know, a bit of a generic quality. This is a lot of the kind of stuff that art students would be making. Um, portraits of family, fellow friends, local landscapes, etc. Um, but you can see as when his, his older sister here um, uh, is passing away, it sort of coincides with the beginning of his mature period of painting, where you know, obviously, he feels a lot of intense, deep emotions for his sister, who is who has this incurable disease, is slowly passing away before his very eyes, and there's nothing he can do about it except kind of keep her company. And one of the things he's doing, he's fresh out of school, is to make some paintings of her to kind of, uh, you know, keep her company and maybe make a painting or two and um and again you know it's like do i just make a academic painting of my sister in bed like does that really convey the experience of what's going on here so you you have here um his sister and probably either one of his other sisters or maybe his aunt kind of uh next to to the bed there you know maybe praying or crying and his sister sort of maybe looking over her head out the window you know it's a kind of a solemn sad painting and you can see then we start seeing these kind of darker uh well not the colors tend to sometimes start to brighten up but the um, the the way they're painted seem to be much more melancholy uh, like, for instance, this is also a very famous painting of his, The Summer Night, which was a little bit controversial when it came out just because of the way it's painted. Um, but again, features a woman sort of, uh, it's believed to be one of his sisters, perhaps, kind of on the side, on the shore there, um, and, uh, you know, looking outward into the, into the ocean, um, just sort of longingly melancholic like you know the you know it's there's an emptiness you know um you know like think about this painting night where it's just sort of this window with the light kind of streaming in it's pretty dark like what is what's missing here um so monk begins to be um, influenced by more and more by the impressionist painters and their bright more saturated use of color and we can see that the paintings start to get more uh, loose with their application of paint brighter with color and uh, right around this period of time edward monk begins a series of artworks he calls the freeze of life and I'm sure there's probably some mention of it in here um, I should also say he, he did do a little bit of traveling he goes to he, he he won an award 
for his art, which gave him an opportunity to go study for a period of time in Paris. He goes to Paris, he studies there for a bit, he meets a number of other artists, he sees the work of artists like Gauguin, Van Gogh, Toulouse-Lautrec. Particularly the work of Gauguin becomes quite influential to him. And, um, and Gauguin, uh, Paul Gauguin, uh, uses very saturated colors and is, is also a, a proponent of using color to communicate emotion. And that has a huge effect on Monk, who, who starts to basically ascribe emotions to colors, you know, like red being an intense color, blue being a sad color. You know, these are still, um, we still have these connotations to color today. Um, uh, and some people believe in them. Some people think it's just uh, nonsense. There's been people who, many people who've tried to study those things. And um, and so therefore, that's why you see like in hospitals, often the colors tend to be relatively pastel. So that they're it's believed to be a kind of a calming um, uh, colors. And I mean, look at this, these, these suicidal thoughts that he's having. I live with the dead, my mother, my sister, my grandfather, my father, kill yourself. And then it's over. Why live? Oh, like, so if that doesn't give you a sense of like depression, somebody dealing with severe depression, I mean, because this is in December 1889, his father passes away and whatever small amount of money he had basically dries up. So now he's really on his own. And so that really puts the fear of, 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 of death in him and creates a certain level of urgency to, to express himself, to do things while he's alive because he also knows that he's been suffering through, with illness throughout his life, so he's got to, you know, get on that horse and ride. Uh, he goes to Berlin. He also meets a number of other artists there. Uh, he really becomes this, uh, the, what he kind of calls this synthesis style, um, and which is basically Gauguin's approach, using, again, color as a language to express emotion. Um, he also becomes a bit of an alcoholic, a lot of drinking happening around this time, which, you know, he's doing a lot of like binge drinking, like going on these, you know, you know, four or five day long benders where he's just getting completely wrecked. Um, and then of course being, you know, uh, you know, you know, if you've ever been really, really drunk for, you know, it's the, it's, uh, you know, the day after is not pleasant, right? So he's sort of in this terrible cycle of alcoholism. Um, but he begins this this a series of works he calls the Freeze of Life. I don't know if here on Wikipedia it mentions them. Um, but it's sent maybe a little bit here. The Freeze of Life is basically a cycle of work that he creates. I think there was six kind of stations of this cycle. And each one of these uh, stations, he produces about three or four artworks to represent these various different themes. And um, let's say in here, there's... I don't know if it lists them in here, uh, but there's, I think there's like angst, love, anxiety, you know, like um, anger. I can't remember what, what all the different ones were, but but suffice to say that the scream is one of those. It's, it belongs to the, the series of artworks that he created called Angst. And he actually made, let's see if we can find in here, uh, three paintings as part of that particular um, uh, station of the the freeze of life. And so we have Despair, An Evening on Carl Johann Street, and The Scream. And so you can, you can see a little bit of this motif of this bridge here in behind, which 
he uses the, the year later to paint the screen. And I do want to just sort of describe... Um, the... Uh, I just want to read this quote here where he's sort of talking about um, the, 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 the inspiration, what, what provoked him to paint the screen. So he writes here in his journal on the 22nd of January, 1892. One evening I was walking along a path. The city was on one side and the fjord below. This is in Oslo. I felt tired and ill. I stopped and looked out over the fjord. The sun was setting and the clouds turned blood red. I sensed a scream passing through nature. It seemed to me that I heard the scream. I painted this picture, painted the clouds as actual blood. The color shrieked. This became the scream. And so he, kind of, he says a similar story here. I just also want to read. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was walking along the road with two friends. The sun was setting. Suddenly the sky turned blood red. I paused, feeling exhausted, and leaned over the fence. There was blood and tongues of fire above <laughs> There was blood and tongues of fire above the blue black fjord in the and the city. My friends walked on, and I stood there trembling with anxiety, and I sensed an infinite scream passing through nature. Wow, right? So he's describing this this situation where he's walking with some friends on this kind of boardwalk overlooking the city and the uh, the kind of the bay in Oslo, kind of on the outer outskirts of Oslo, and and it's disputed as to exactly what's going on here. Some say that this is. Um, uh, Basically, his recollection of the the explosion of uh, Krakatoa, the volcano, which had happened back in uh, 1883, and Krakatoa um, was. Um, let's just see, just so I can get this straight. Basically, you know, even though it was very far away, let's let's actually let's get the coordinates for Krakatoa here. You know, like on the other side of the planet, this volcano here explodes and creates all sorts of like uh, um, weather conditions all over the world. Like you remember just a, maybe a decade ago, there was a volcano that they erupted in Iceland and it basically shut air traffic down for a week and caused all sorts of chaos with communications, people's internets and things were going down. Similar sort of thing, except perhaps maybe even much larger had happened um, because of the eruption of Krakatoa. And so there, there was lots of descriptions of the, the, the colors in the sky, you know, being red for days on end. For, and this lasted for, for months, for basically eight, nine months, all over the world, where people saw all sorts of unusual atmospheric effects, which just shows you how powerful a volcano can be. Um, so some people are saying that what he's talking about is this recollection of, of the sky kind of seeming to mysteriously change. Because, again, if you're thinking about a volcano erupting literally on the other side of the planet... Um, you, you don't hear it, you don't see it, you don't feel any vibrations of it, and yet it's seemingly... So when the sky on the other side of the world kind of changes into strange colors, um, it seems like it's just happening purely on its own, right? It's It would be very hard to make any connection between that and this volcano that erupted months and months earlier. So some people say that that's what's happening. Um, other people say that it's de him dealing with the the various different traumas in his life. His sister, who had recently passed away, his um, 
father who had recently passed away. Obviously, he's dealing with all sorts of suicidal issues and feelings. Um, some people say that it's um, um, based on some articles and newspapers he saw of these mummies that had recently been unearthed um, and that had these, you know, very similar kind of postures as the, the screaming figure. Uh, I mean, we can speculate endlessly as, as to what provoked those emotions. But you do see here, you know, Despair, the painting that he made earlier, basically is, is a direct description of that moment of him walking with two friends in the background and him sort of just like, like, oh man, looking over the edge of this boardwalk at the city below, just feeling completely like overwhelmed, right? And then, and he describes this, this sound, this scream. And so that's an, another interesting thing that when we, when we see the scream, often we talk about the figure as being the one that is screaming. And I was watching an interesting documentary last night, and so they were talking about the difference between just like the, the, the shape of the mouth, of this figure being kind of like, which is, they were saying, is not the kind of shape of the mouth that people have when they themselves are screaming. When people scream, they tend to go, ah, and the mouth gets really wide. And so that this is perhaps more the reaction to a person who's like, oh, kind of in fear, or, oh, like hearing a scream passing through nature and he's kind of like shrinking from this scream that he hears emanating from nature around him. Again, what that is that he hears or believes he's hearing or perceives is all is up for endless debate and again people have written their doctoral theses on all of this but you have him sort of lost uh his friends sort of walking away kind of like wow what's with edward man he is whoo, lost his marbles today we're just gonna we're just gonna walk, keep on going here edward uh you want to meet us at the pub later on? Um, hope, you know, uh, okay. Oh, right, and then you have this, the companion piece, uh, also part of this series, the evening on Carl Johann Street, which um, sort of features this crowd of figures with these same kind of blank zombie-like stares approaching the, the artist. And perhaps that's him sort of describing this sense of alienation from um from the war of from the people the community around him of sort of feeling like maybe everyone's looking at me with these big eyes maybe i don't belong here you know what's the why continue going on why try to fight your way through this crowd of like a like a tsunami of people um approaching him uh he makes he continues to to make other paintings a part of this this whole uh series the freeze of life i won't go too much more into that because perhaps we'll do another one of the paintings from that series uh so This, this painting here, that Madonna, perhaps arguably his second most famous painting, is a beautiful painting, although because it features a little bit of nudity, I'm maybe less um, likely to, to do it as part of one of these episodes. Um, maybe I should probably move on here so I can get this, these, this painting started, but I just want to kind of show a little bit of some other images just sort of looking at his style of painting and how we can kind of use that to make today's artwork. Uh, so, you know, I love Edvard Munch's style and it is very different than, than a lot of the other work that was being done at the time and even subsequently. There's only a very small number of artists even working today that 
work in a style that I would say is similar to to the work of Edward Munch. Probably the most famous uh, artist that I can think of who was working in a Munch-inspired style would be Peter Doig. We did a Peter Doig painting um, uh, a few years ago, this painting right here. Um, let's see if there's... works that of his that like Peter Doig's work tends to have like these this very both like drippy transparent quality a lot of kind of outlining of things and not maybe in the way that we normally outline but almost like when you're doodling and you maybe you draw a person and then you maybe draw some you trace around that person and then you trace around the tracing and then you kind of have this these radiating lines going out front if you're i don't know if anybody else ever doodled like that but um i see that a lot in the work of edward munk where you know he, he let's say maybe paints a hillside and then the lines around it continue to kind of emphasize that form and he just kind of you know and that, that was one of the reasons why I also uh, juxtaposed his work this week with Emily Carr, because Emily Carr kind of does a similar kind of thing, like kind of, I wouldn't say obsessively, but but it kind of goes in and, and like, it's, it's almost like um, a ceramicist kind of polishing something, continuing to kind of you know, shape something, you know, a bowl or a vase, and that's that's the closest kind of metaphor I can think of when it comes to Monk's work here. Um, like, you see it in these lines that kind of shape figures like that. You can see this a lot in his, um, in his uh, woodcuts, because he also became very um uh, a major uh innovator with with in printmaking he also did several uh printed versions or, or well he had two two main let me see if they have where's my screen um Okay, maybe, maybe I'll just show you here. So this is believed to be the first version of the screen, this pastel drawing. And then the painted version, the one that we're going to do today, um, this lithograph, this woodblock print that he cut here, and then the pastel version, another one I was hoping to do today. Well, I don't know if I'll have time to do it. This is the one that is, for a short period of time in, in 2012, was the most expensive artwork ever sold at auction. It is now, I think, number 20 on the list. So it just goes to show how how um, the, the kind of rampant speculation in the art world um, has, you know, in the auction uh, world has, has just gone mad over the past decade. <laughs> that 120 is... is nowhere near the top of that list anymore and this is a painting he did in 1910 um this and okay so there's so many different stories i could tell about all of this um this this version the one that we're going to do today you know was stolen um during the opening ceremonies to the lillehammer olympics in 1994 because um, Norway, being a, a northern country, is generally at the top or very close to the top of um, the medal standings at Winter Olympics. Usually has the most or comes in second place for the most amount of gold medals or overall medals. So everyone is watching the opening ceremonies to the Lillehammer Olympics, Lillehammer, Norway, and so some very clever thieves were like, hey, literally everyone is at home watching the, the Olympics on television. 
it's probably a good time to go uh, steal something from the local museum. So anyway, this painting was stolen during that time. There was some damage to the painting, a few tears in there, because all of these works were painted on cardboard, which were then subsequently mounted to wooden frames, as opposed to painting on canvas. Now, cardboard back in the day was different than the cardboard we know today. This is not corrugated cardboard. It would be more similar to like a very, very, very thick paper. You know, like a, uh, it was used in the same way we use cardboard today, but just not with the corrugation as we know. Um, this version of the painting was also stolen, this time in 2004, in a very brazen robbery where, where some um, men, two men came into the Munch Museum in uh, Oslo with, with uh, machine guns. You know, it was like a heist from a Batman movie, told everyone to get on the ground. They took two uh, very famous Munch paintings, obviously this one and the Madonna uh, that I showed briefly before and ran out the front door into a car and drove away. And really that was, you know, by far the, the most um, outrageous art theft in Norway at the time, but but still to this day is ranks as probably one of the most brazen art thefts of all time. And so this version is painted in 1910, obviously, you know, a, a couple decades after the first um, series of works. But this sort of comes out of, of Monk being, you know, th this work clearly hit a nerve almost immediately. People were both kind of shocked by this painting, but also kind of, they couldn't get it out of their heads. They were just like, man, I, I hated that painting, it was so disturbing. And yet they couldn't stop talking about it. You know, it's like maybe one of those movies where you come out and you're just like, oh, damn it hated that movie and then for like weeks and weeks and weeks you're just talking about it, talking about it, thinking about it obsessing over it and then you're like oh i i, I just i gotta see that movie again because i uh, oh, i just I, i'm trying to figure out exactly and then you watch it and you're like well it uh it is a disturbing movie yes but you know maybe maybe it's not so bad after all maybe it's really good just really intense right so um it was it's like one of those things where you know musician hits like you know has one of those one hit wonders and then people are like you got to make another song just like that and so for in in the case of visual artists like well what if i make another painting just like that would that be okay or what if i make some prints of that and we can distribute those prints um unfortunately only 45 copies of this print were made before the printer literally wiped the plate clean and so that there the um, no more prints could be made from it uh, but um, that also kind of helped increase the the visibility of this artwork and it also both of these paintings the paintings found themselves in museum collections quite quickly quite soon after they were produced the original pastels also in a museum in uh, Norway. This work here, the one that sold at auction in 2012, is the only one of the series that is not in a museum collection in Norway. So currently it's in the private collection of an American collector, Leon Black, here in the United States. For a brief period of time it was on display at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, but um, I'm not sure where it is now. It's probably sitting in someone's, in Leon Black's office, or in a, um, or probably even more likely in a vault somewhere, uh, because the insurance costs for this painting must be just through the roof. Considering it is, the two other versions have been stolen in very high profile thefts, likelihood is that this is probably not actually in Leon Black's house, unless he's got a security card with a handgun standing right next to it. Okay, I think I want to cover more of Monk's biography in another episode so that I can get to today's painting, um, because there's there's so much to talk about. I mean, 
there's various different commissions, large artworks that he created. Um, did I show those big paintings? He did these murals, uh, this, these beautiful big, well not murals, he painted on giant canvases for the, the main lecture hall at the main university in Oslo. Um, that's an interesting story. And then the, the last couple decades, he dealt with severe eye, um, degenerative eye uh, diseases that, that led to him creating very odd uh, paintings that have often this big empty um, space inside. I just want to try to get to see if we see any of those weird paintings. And then, of course, during uh, World War II, Norway was occupied by the Nazis, who um, who de had declared Edvard Munch's work to be degenerate, and um, was uh, you know he was basically under house arrest. You know, he's a really old man. He's in his his late seventies during that time, but you know that's pretty kind of scary when there's an invading force in occupying your country and they've labeled you and your artwork to be degenerate <laughs> and they're actively you know confiscating some of your work burning some of your work you know the outlook is not positive anyway i just want to share with you some of these pictures here we have an image of edward monk on the beach making paintings he also, see if there's some images of himself. He had an outdoor studio where he would paint, and that studio would uh, get, it was an open studio, it was basically in a barn outside of his house, and the it would snow and rain on his paintings, and so some of these paintings had really terrible mold issues. Uh, so he really was not, taking care of his work very well so that's caused all sorts of uh, frustration for generations of conservators around the world um, okay so let's move on let's move this guy out of the way for now Let's see, now do we want to do an underpainting on this picture? Let's just examine the original and think a little bit about how we want to approach this artwork to begin with. Now, I spent really the last couple days since we finished uh, the uh, Emily Carr painting really looking at and doing some research into Edward Munch's painting style, his approach to painting. Now he's painting uh, with oil paint, and again, this case onto cardboard. So one of the things with cardboard, like canvas or gesso, is that it absorbs water very easily. And it, so it looks to me like he's painting with very thin, almost totally transparent uh, colors. Um, almost like a watercolor. So he's really diluting his paint with a lot of turpentine. And that turpentine is soaking into the, into the cardboard and basically staining the cardboard. So I think even before I do my underpainting, what I should have done earlier while I was blabbing on is I want to coat these with another color on top. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's like a kind of a paper like uh, quality. So let's make a kind of um, cool brown. Let's take some cool yellow, a little bit of cool blue. too much blue in there. Ah, sorry. Okay. So 
I just took my cool blue, cool yellow, mixed up a very small amount of brown. There's some white. And this matte medium. In fact, I'm just going to put some of that white to the side so it's not. So it's ideally more like. Um, one third white paint to matte medium. Matte medium is a clear acrylic. It's just a, a paint without any color in it, you could say. So there's my white. Let's bring a bit of... This brown. In fact, you know what? Let's take all of that brown. The color's a little bit darker, isn't it? to get even darker. Let's take a bit more. still think I could, well, you know, I, I know I'm in a bit of a hurry, but, you know, let's do it right. If we're going to do this, let's do it right. I didn't mean to go that blue. I think that's good. It's it's going to be a little transparent, so I think that slightly reddish brown should work with that uh, yellow. Let's just make sure I got it nice and stirred in here. to get one painting started, let alone two here. Really messed up on my ratios.
I could go darker. So let's do this again. Don't want to have to get the big bucket of matte medium out here. It's a little bit darker. So when I, whenever I do this kind of thing, I'm just trying to get as much paint on the canvas, and then I do this kind of thing, which is to, to try to spread it out evenly. So I try to get paint all over the surface. So that's better. <laughs> Second time's a charm, although this is not the one I was planning on working on today. Uh, it is a little bit more on the red side, but I kind of dig that. those two side by side see this one's a little bit more opaque a little bit more transparent so i think i'm just gonna do is i'll blow dry both of these and then i think i'm gonna do a little bit more uh, it's, it's another layer on this first one You got, I love reading the chat there.
that one I'm pretty happy with. A few things, you know, at somehow when I was fiddling around doing things, I got a little bit of, of, I don't know, something on, on the surface, probably some dust or something. Uh, and it's best to wait until the, the pictures dry before you try to wipe them off. Otherwise, you're just going to smear the paint. And you've probably seen me do just that, smear the paint. <laughs> and then um, curse at myself for, for doing just that. So um, patience is always is a virtue when it comes to making art. I was just getting my matte medium big jug out. <laughs> I, uh, what a what a uh, mess here, Michael. My goodness. Oh, if you think this is messy when I'm not on camera, I tend to be even a little bit more. Uh, all over the place here. So, uh, let's make this even more brown. don't think I'm going to put any more white into this mixture. There's probably plenty enough in here, so I'm mostly just going to paint this darker brown. This might, might, this might end up being a little bit darker than I expected, but the original itself has a pretty dark brown, so I'm not too afraid of overshooting my mark here. Like, let's just look at these uh, side by side here. Right, I'm looking for the brown that's underneath. Yeah, I think I'm on the right track. Uh, it is, there's always the danger whenever you're doing this that you might uh, paint a, a layer of paint that is too opaque and obliterate your pencil lines, which sometimes happens 
Um, it's happened to me before in, in, on in these episodes. Worst comes to worst, we can always just paint the yeah, or do the image transfer a second time. Not ideal, but uh, I've had to do it on these episodes before, so um, it wouldn't be the first time. And knowing what ratio works or not takes some practice. Like you can see with me, like, I mean, my palette was a bit of a mess there. I was just sort of eyeballing it. Which I could, I could imagine if you're a beginner painter, seeing that just seems like... Like, how many, you know, uh, how much matte medium did you just put in there? I don't know, kind of... Not too much, not too little. Oh, that's really, really helpful, Michael. That uh, that solves all my problems. <laughs> okay, I think that's good. Let's. It's definitely got a bit of a a pinkish, purpley quality. Yes, that is little bit you know it's less brown maybe but I kind of like that I kind of yeah it's kind of a I, again I always like bright colors I like I like color I like saturation and um, that does mean that maybe a lot of the paintings that I do for this uh, this these master study series tend to be a little bit louder color wise I mean just look at the last episode the Emily Carr one was certainly louder than Emily Carr who herself was pretty loud <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but what can you do cannot um, deny thyself Oh, there's Ari Paint says, I've watched and painted many videos, but never live. First time today. I'm not fast enough to paint at the same time as Mike, though. <laughs> Great to see you, Ari. That's awesome. I love that you're painting, or you're at least watching and, and attempting to paint um, in real time with me. That's great. Always for me, trying to find that balance between not going too slow that people like fall asleep, which some of you like to, to watch me paint while you fall asleep, um, and also not going too quickly to kind of just lose people. So, you know, um, <laughs> so I just sort of just do what I do, put some timestamps down below, and if people want to watch, they can they can if they get bored they can tune away or come back later on and i'm probably not too much further ahead okay i'm gonna blow dry this before i move
Barbara says, um, these master classes are addictive and so educational too. I'm always amazed that anyone paints along. I'm so slow I have to paint along later. <laughs> and um, Ismo says, I used to watch Bob Ross. Now I watch you to help me sleep. Only kidding. <laughs> thank you. And Ari says, thank you. I am addicted indeed. And Lolly says, you're not alone. This is also known as Markowski Art Addicts Anonymous. <laughs> it's a safe space. <laughs> and Ismo says, it actually is a safe space. Oh my goodness, you guys crack me up. That's why I love doing these, because partly just the, the hilarity that comes out of the comments. That's... Is, um, okay. So, you know, one of the things here is... I don't know if you can see it. I can still see my pencil lines. They are very muted, though. So it it is going to be a bit of a challenge to see them. Now, I could, at this stage, do some outlining if I or underpainting. So let's let's just look at the original and just decide how we want to progress here. Now, how would Monk have done this? You can see how kind of quickly he's painting, or at least the, the brush strokes are done quickly. That doesn't necessarily mean he painted the painting quickly. And I know you might be like, well, I don't, sorry, what's the difference? Well, you know, it's the difference between like, like a, like baseball or golf um, in the sense that there are these moments of, of, you know, like golf, you know, there's a lot of walking around and kind of observing and chatting and hushed tones. And then there's whoo, swing and the ball flying across. And it's like, whoa. And that's slow again. And painting can be like that too, where, you know, there's not a lot of action. And then whoo, one brush stroke. Woof, 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 woof. A few brush strokes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And then standing back, looking at it for a while, examining it. So um, we can have fast brush strokes that, that, are, um, that are painted quickly, but over a longer period of time. So, it, and who, so just discerning how long he spent on a painting like this is very different than, than how quickly the brush strokes were applied. In terms of, so I do think I'm going to paint, I'm going to kind of combine the, the I'm going to start kind of com start basically painting the painting, but a little bit as the under painting. So, um, because again, every artist works in a very different approach. And Monk, just like anybody else, is, is maybe using a different approach than any other artist. And so there can be times where some artists will just start directly painting on the canvas. The one reason why I don't think he just did that exactly is we can see, if we get up close, well, I was gonna say it's a pencil line, but what? It almost looks like he scored the paper or something. Or is that another sheet of paper that he's added there? So this area, right, this red stripe. What is going on there? That is that an, that's, that looks like another piece of paper now that I look at it. Hmm. Um. And that might be a red pencil. No, that's, or sorry, a blue pencil. I do have blue colored pencils. 
I could use for this. My only worry is that the pencils I have, my colored pencils are water soluble, which means if I get them wet, they could smear. So let's say I drew, let's just take some of this paint that I just used. Okay, I thought they would smudge. They're not really smudging. Okay, well, it is getting into the color a little bit, but I'm actually kind of amazed at how it's. I, I was expecting it to, let's say, if I get actual water on there, it will. Ugh, ah, it wasn't on camera. Okay, let's do that again. So let's say, move Michael. Okay, let's. So this water soluble uh, uh, paint will allow me to kind of get some water in here and I can kind of brush it out. Now this is not really watercolor paper so it's not working very effectively or at least doesn't appear to be but I was surprised when I took my acrylic paint and painted over it that it stayed relatively stable like I really have to go in there in order to activate it with my paint that's why it's good to try your your materials there because that is definitely not what I expected at all and <coughs> I'm also if I do use this material let's not be too surprised if it all goes terribly wrong <laughs> oh did I take all my pencils to work with me So I just was recalling that I lent a bunch of my colored pencils to my students at Emily Carr, uh, the university I teach at, and it took them a while to get them, give them back to me. So uh, and it looks like some of the colors that I lent did not return home here. So I think, well, I'll just show you just so I'm clear about the materials I'm using. Because I don't think I've used pencils in a painting before. Um, so this is the Supra Color, the Caran uh pencil colors. 
This originally came with all of these colors in there. But at one point I was doing a series of drawings that had a lot of grays and browns. So I went and just bought a bunch of them. And then all of the other colors were in a box. They were in this box that I took to school. But you can see they have since disappeared. So... Okay. Anyway... Not cheap. These are like $2 pencils. A little grumble there that uh, students didn't return them after they borrowed them. Uh, but uh, hopefully they're getting some good use. Okay. So I'm going to use this blue. And maybe while I was doing that, I should look for... Red. Look at this. You lend out your pencils, and this is how they they come back to you. <laughs> ah, okay. So, um... Yeah, Barbara says, Heads up to any of Michael's students who are watching. Give his pencils back. <laughs> Um, so, oh, and there's Jeannie. Nice to see you, Jeannie. Um, thanks for the watercolor demo, pe watercolor pencil demo. I have those. Maybe paint soon. Fixed income issues. Totally. Use the, use the stuff that you got. Absolutely. I think that's actually, you know, very creative. I mean, artists like Edvard Munch, like I don't I don't know the story behind why he used cardboard here. Um, it's possible that he didn't have enough money to buy canvas. It's possible that he he just liked that surface to paint on, which would be much smoother than canvas. So, um, throughout history like I mean, cardboard was quite a popular material for artists to use in the 1880s, 1890s, because it was all over the place. It was a very common packaging material, just like today. Now, I think it's a higher quality material than the cardboard that you might have your Amazon packages showing up in. Again, it's not corrugated, but um, uh, it... It certainly did the job you know you would all of you know if you go to your grocery store a hundred years ago there would just be stacks of this all sorts of all the canned vegetables coming in cardboard boxes and so if you're an artist you'd be like oh can i take some of your cardboard to make some painting like sure i got so much of this stuff whatever get, get, take it help yourself so it was basically a free material to paint and draw on and some of the greatest works of all time <coughs> were done using basically the, the the freely available materials. So feel free to to dive in. Okay, so I do want to uh, go over some of my 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 uh, lines here. Let's zoom in. Start with the <clears throat> so you may or may not be able to see some of this here. Oh, hmm. Okay, this is good to know. I, it's okay so I'm trying to draw with this blue pencil on this canvas but either the canvas is this is not quite dry enough um, or the pencil pencil should be soft enough not 
but it's a little bit like I'm kind of, I have to, let me go over these lines a little bit, which is very monk-like. Um, otherwise, I, I'm going to kind of, Im, uh, not what's the opposite of emboss. Some of those lines are going on a little bit easier than others. I don't think out of all of these 300 plus episodes I've ever done one with <coughs> colored pencil. I, mean, I used to use colored pencil all the time for doing my the uh, image transfer but that would stay on the, the, the printed outline. It's always fun to switch things up a little bit. It already does feel a little bit more monk like. Oops, let's bring that up there.
let's just take this red. I can barely see my pencil lines. So. <clears throat> I think some of those are going to be in quote unquote the wrong places, but that's okay. detour probably longest ever underpainting section of ah, Pascal's there nice to see you Pascal Jeannie <clears throat> uh, says sorry to be rude earlier hello everyone <laughs> I don't think you're being rude by not greeting everybody genie that uh, you guys are so sweet what if this is going to be the politest group of people on the entire internet especially on youtube if you ever read youtube comments they can be pretty nasty and you guys are so sweet uh pascal says oh well monk did many of those maybe some were traced like we do possibly possibly that's a good great point <laughs> okay, <clears throat> let's move on here, finally. So, well, yeah, we're only two hours in and we're just starting with our background pass. Okay, so what we want to do next here is start to get some color in. And again, thinking about the way that Monk painted, he's using a, a, a oil paint, at least in this painting, not in all of his paintings, certainly. But with um, this version of the scream, <clears throat> or the scream of nature, as he originally called it, I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, it's it's almost like he's painting with a, a watercolor-like consistency. So what he's doing is he's taking his oil paints and he's diluting them with a lot of of turpentine again maybe that was a way that he was thinking of saving some money right just because when you add turpentine to oil paint it thins it out it's it's similar to let's say using glazing fluid like we do although it has almost the opposite effect it, it dries very quickly if you're using because turpentine you know as a solvent if you've ever you know it's like um what's this it's what would like maybe it's like alcohol like if like the kind of alcohol you put on a cut or or, or more like um uh like what is that they're called hand sanitizer like you know you put it on your hands and it goes on really goopy and wet and then you just keep rubbing it and 20 seconds later your hands are bone dry it's like turpentine is is almost the same chemically i mean not well there's lots of other things in hand sanitizer but <clears throat> for our sake uh, so turpentine will evaporate really quickly. So artists could paint, often with the oil painters would use like heavily turpentined oil paint to do an underpainting like we've just done because it will evaporate within seconds and it's ready to be painted over top of and especially because it'll absorb into the fabric very quickly. So that's what I think he's doing here is using... Um, uh, yeah, Pas Pascal says, like, acetone. Absolutely. Exactly. Great, great point. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure there's a, a medium out there that is, is, has been created to replicate that, that it, it would be like using your glazing, like a glazing fluid that dries almost instant, instantaneously. I'm sure golden or one of the manufacturers has come up with a material like that for us it just means i'm gonna 
basically use my glazing fluid <clears throat> and then just uh, blow dry it in order to speed that process up. So I think what I want to do is start with the sky. And it's also, let's take also a moment here. I, I often use uh, Edvard Munch's paintings as an example of artists inverting the warm and cool color relationships. Because if we look at this painting, you'll see the sky has been painted with warm red, right? And then this red stripe along the front, which is arguably the closest thing in the foreground to us, the viewer, is painted with a cool red. So you have your, in this case, your warm colors in the background. You've got a warm blue here. And then you've got some cooler blues here. Um, this is probably a warm, maybe a, almost a cobalt blue, probably warm and blue, a Prussian blue in the foreground. So in, and you got this cool green here, darker, cooler green. So in almost every place, Edvard Munch is using warm colors in the background, cool or cooler colors in the foreground, which is almost the exact opposite of everything we've done in this class where typically we put our warm colors in the foreground and cool colors in the background now why would he do that Does, was edward monk just uh insane or was he stupid no he 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 would have learned that concept of warm colors in the foreground cool colors in the background so if you think for a moment why he would deliberately have kind of quote unquote mixed them up essentially what i think he's doing is he's trying to use color and his knowledge of color theory to um, destabilize the viewer to create some anxiety in the viewer to help us feel like the person in the screen, right? In that when we look at this painting, it might not be necessarily evident to the vast majority of people, but when you look at it, you might feel like there's something weird going on in this painting. Yeah, okay, okay. there's obviously the way the color and everything is applied in this like almost skull-like figure, but <clears throat> there's something like, like odd about this. I can't put my finger quite on it right and so i think what he's trying to do is make us feel a little bit disoriented like is it just like why does the sky feel closer to oh uh, whoa why does the sky feel closer to us than maybe the you know the the figure in the foreground or maybe some of the other the boardwalk and we might not know why that's happening, but now that you know a little bit about color theory over the past few hundred episodes, you might be like, oh, that's interesting. He's really, like Pascal says, create an optical paradox. Yeah. <laughs> Genie says, Krakatoa inverted his world. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so let's... Um, I think in, in a previous video I did, I might have sort of corrected that quote-unquote problem and put the cool colors in the background, warm colors in the foreground. But with today's episode, I'm going to kind of hew close to what uh, Monk himself did here. So uh, let's get a kind of a smaller size brush. I have a brush about the size of my pinky finger here. And I'm going to take uh, my <clears throat> glazing fluid here. I just realized this wasn't screwed on. I could have just launched <laughs> paint all over my studio. Uh, it reminds me, when I was a teenager, I worked uh, as a busboy at the Hard Rock Cafe in Calgary, Alberta, where I'm originally from. And... We used to do this thing where you used to marry ketchup bottles. And what that is, is you take, you know, you got one ketchup bottle that's half full and another one that's half full. And you'd, you'd drain them and marry them into one full bottle, right? 
I don't know if that's even legal to do these days. I don't know. The food industry is. But anyway, that was what I was told and trained to do. So that's what I did. And so in order to get, you know, your ketchup to go all the way down to the bottom, you'd kind of take your ketchup bottle upside down and kind of shake it like that to kind of force the ketchup. Because as you know, ketchup can, you know, wants to stay at the bottom of this. So you'd kind of go like that. Anyway, I remember I was, <laughs> I was working there. You know, it's like probably two in the morning. I'm 16 or 17 years old. And I've got this ketchup bottle. And and I'd kind of go like, woof, woof. And <laughs> the lid flies off. And ketchup went all over the ceiling. And these were like really high. Like you needed like a, a scissor lift to get up to the roof. All over the ceiling, all over the wall, all over the floor. <laughs> a whole bottle of ketchup. And, um, uh, like, um, you know, like, oh my goodness. So immediately I get down, I'm just trying to frantically clean this off. And, you know, a manager comes up because I'm kind of in a, a quiet abandoned area. Not abandoned, but, you know, like they've closed that section down, closing down for the night. A manager comes up and sees me clean. He's like, oh my goodness, what a, what a mess. And I'm like, and I were like, yeah, I don't know, like, it's, you know, sorry, I got all this. And it's like, you know, some of these people, you know, the customers, they just have no respect, you know, just a disaster. Ah. Meanwhile, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, totally. It was those, those terrible customers, just terrible people come here. <laughs> and uh, anyway, that's a moment in my life. Um, so when that, when I realized that wasn't closed on, it brought vivid memories to that moment where I was, uh, like past us the Rothcode ceiling with ketchup. That's, that would be the proper title for sure. I like that. Okay. <clears throat> so let's zoom a little bit into the sky here and do the same. I might, we'll see how opaque I made my color. I, mean, I tried not to go too dark, but uh, maybe in fact, let's just make it a little bit more transparent. So what do we got? I think this is... You know, I see like, you know, I probably could really have gone for a darker background color might have been more appropriate, but whatever.
Uh, now I got a little bit of extra space at the top. I might just add an extra little bit of of the sky that's not there, just for fun. <clears throat> Uh, let's continue here. While I got this color on my brush, let's see. There's a little bit there. So even though these colors are going to go darker later on, <clears throat> what's kind of nice is if we outline them with a little bit of red, which I see is kind of what he's done in a few places at least here, they're going to go much darker when they dry. So Trying to get this red in here. It's a little confusing with all these lines, so I'm just looking at his elbow in fact it kind of looks like maybe he painted this whole thing red. Just a little bit of blurring of the paint there. Or of the pencil crayon, I mean.
<clears throat> okay. So I think that would be kind of close to what we would have seen on his painting at this stage. <clears throat> Let's go to do the same thing with some warm yellow. So I'm going to take some of my glazing fluid. I'm not even going to bother cleaning my brush. I don't care if it's got a little orangey. Some of this warm yellow. Now it's, it's possible and even likely that I'm going to go back over some of this with, with more concentrated color. But I think he's, you know, kind of building it up. Like, often artists might do something like this, lay some semi-transparent colors down, because they might not be totally sure that this is the color they want to use in this particular area so it's like if i go really light i can just sort of put it in there that'll give me a sense if it's you know right or wrong and if i change my mind then that's okay i won't have irrevocably altered the painting at all So this whole area down here, I think he got a little confused with these lines. And so that's why, you know, this, you can see this line right here doesn't actually continue over here. There's sort of like a missing line. I think he drew it there, but forgot to paint it in or something happened there anyway. Let's zoom back out here again. And now let's take, um, let's take a bit of cool blue this time. So again, we're take our or, and again, you see, I didn't clean my paintbrush. I'll take a bit of cool blue, put this on my brush here. 
kind of like that color as is with a bit of that warm yellow in there. It's got a little bit of a teal kind of quality. some other blues back there or uh, warmer blues <clears throat> this is all warm blue in here This bright, uh, cool green we'll put in later on. <clears throat> okay. Moving right along. Let's do the same thing with some warm blue now. I'm again, not going to bother even cleaning my brush. Just take some warm blue. painting this far hill here. <clears throat> With these warm colors, which would be about the opposite of what we normally do here.
So I think here <clears throat> on the boardwalk, he's using an almost totally transparent uh, warm blue to just add a little bit of color in here. Go back to a bit of that green. I think I want to get a bit more of this green. that with a little bit of water that's why I love glazing fluid is because if you don't like what you've done you can just use a little bit of water and erase it with a rag which is not necessarily the way most acrylic paints behave <clears throat> and then lastly we'll just take our cool red Maybe even with just a tad bit of, of warm, or sorry, cool blue in there. I'll put a bit of cool yellow in here, just to kind of make this a bit more brownish. Okay, I think that's good for uh, uh, our first pass here. <laughs> Kathy says, I remember you telling that story of the ketchup before. <laughs> Barbara says, let's hope the manager isn't watching. Well, that was like 30, well, not 30 years, about 25 years ago or so that the Hard Rock Cafe closed down 20 years ago there so long gone there's been three or four other restaurants in that same place since so um <laughs> okay so this might look a little bit watery a little bit transparent but this is i i'm you know i, I i'm not saying this is exactly the way that monk's painting looked come on at one point, but it wouldn't have surprised me if he had started it this way. And certainly the, the the consistency of the paint that I'm applying here would have been similar. Um, you could see some of his colors are a little bit darker, but I think we're gonna we're, we'll do that as we go here. So uh, let's go to. Now that we've got um, the quote-unquote background established, really what I, I've just done is, is painted the whole thing everywhere with lighter 
like you might say like washes of color uh, to give it that bit of a watercolory like quality now I'm going to go over with some more opaque colors to start to bring this painting to life uh, and give it more contrast because right now it is it appears fairly muted right like very light watercolory kind of quality so um, let's let's bring the painting back <coughs> in just quick comparison and just think about what needs to be done next uh, well probably what I should do is blow dry it next that's a big thing um, but then I want to go in and start with a smaller brush now painting in some of the more bold areas of color um, so I'm going to like take basically warm red right out of the tube and just paint that right across the top there in these areas so let's do that um, let's get, yeah, one of the smaller brushes that I've got the, all of these paintings are actually quite large, like so what, uh, 36 by 29 inches essentially. You know, so that's, you know, if you see any of these, these paintings in person, you're like, oh, that's maybe a little bit bigger than I was expecting them to be. So his painting, you know, you, you think 36, so it's basically three times the size at least uh, than the one that we're working on. So if you find it a little tricky to get into those details, don't worry, you know, that's not surprising. Many of the paintings we work on are, are obviously much smaller, or the our canvases are much smaller than the originals. I'm just going to blow dry this here. Okay, so I, I did say I was going to go full on pure paint without any, but you know, I'm going to still take a bit of glazing fluid in here, because uh, they're not, they're, it's, because what, okay, it, um, I'm, I'm trying to replicate the look of what he did with oil paint, but do, using acrylic. And often, we can't do the exact same kind of thing. And I don't see, like, in his... Like, I think he's, he's probably just dipping more and more uh, paint into that, this probably very wet mixture and painting. Well, actually, no, maybe, maybe I'm doing it all right the way I was expecting. I don't know. Anyway, let's um, let's go for the sky up here. <laughs> uh, let's start up a little bit higher.
also want to try to avoid <clears throat> too much texture. Because uh, I think this painting looks like it has virtually no texture. Very transparent or very th thin applications of paint. You can see how the paint sort of dries off, drips, or you, by the time he sort of gets across to the sides, the paintbrush kind of dries up a little bit. <clears throat> a bit more glazing fluid into my warm red not too much but just like I might have even have gone this might be a bit intense those colors now that I see them but again anyone who's been painting with me for a while knows that's kind of par for the course I tend to kind of go a little bit much
I know this is all going to be brown, but it's a very dark brown, <clears throat> and I'll probably mix a brown later on, but uh, I can also sort of get a bit of that color just by layering reds and blues. This is fun. I've never really tried to explore Edward Munch's technique like this, and I really like the effects that it gets. Really cool. I really enjoy this one. Okay, <clears throat> let's. I'm gonna blow dry this. Um, you know, again, we're using, or well, at least I'm using this satin glazing fluid, and one of the properties of this fluid is that it has a uh, a chemical in there that slows the drying time down and if we're doing glazing that's great because then we we have a lot of time to kind of soften our edges with a, a soft dry brush but in this instance I kind of want to be able to paint over all of these layers relatively quickly without kind of wiping that color away so I'm just going to blow dry it and try to get it as dry as possible. There's going to be a few areas that are going to stay a little bit more wet because they're, they're a little bit more thickly applied.
there's uh <clears throat> where did i see that comment ari says it's the middle of the day in north america are you all from canada or united states and barbara says not all from usa or canada i'm in england <laughs> oh and there's Gradic says hello i just finished your first drawing lesson i'm so excited to finish the entire course awesome i'd love to see that again join the facebook group i can't wait to see what you create with those new skills you develop uh, barbara says i'm so glad you're doing the drawing course i found it last year and did the whole course through 2023 it's brilliant oh what a lovely group of people ah you're so supportive thank you barbara for such kind words i appreciate that <clears throat> okay um what should we do let's let's carry on in the same i think we did the warm red the warm yellow then i did cool blue warm then a cool green and then warm blue and cool red <clears throat> your guess as as good as mine as the logic that comes out of this um head <laughs> uh. Well, there, the, the, the logic was obviously, again, using our warmer colors in the background and moving to, to as I'm moving to the foreground, I was actually using cooler colors. And again, I want to stress <clears throat> that this painting basically contradicts all of the color theory that I've been talking about for the past 322 episodes, right? So... Um, if you're just joining us for the very first time, you're like, oh, I guess so the warm colors go in the background and cool colors go in the foreground. Sorry to confuse you. <laughs> that's that's one of the reasons why I've, it's taken me a while to come to do this. I did this, this is one of the very, very first paintings I did about 10 years ago on this channel before I really started doing these live streams. And so I really did want to come back and revisit it finally. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. Let's take some of this warm yellow now, and I'm still going to take a bit of glazing fluid, just a much higher concentration of paint. Glazing fluid is going to help me get a bit more of a slightly watery quality. <coughs> and the other thing I love the most about glazing fluid is because it takes longer to dry, I have a little bit of flexibility. If I'm not happy with it, I can actually wipe that color right away. <coughs> so. Now that is a bit too transparent. So I'm just upping the ratio of more. Um, um, warm yellow to glazing fluid. So now it's probably 70% paint, just a little bit of glazing fluid in there. Man, they look like I could even get a little bit darker. Now, that's because he's painting on that darker cardboard. And so everything just seems a little bit darker. I mean, worse comes to worse. I could also just glaze, you know, a little bit of brown over top of everything. And just to kick that color, all the colors down a little bit. Um, but that would... Uh, that would be really nitpicky and probably... You know, dull 
I mean, the, the purpose would be to dull the colors, but it might have too severe of uh, an effect. This definitely is inspiring me to do more Monk paintings. I, mean, I think Edvard Monk is obviously, he's well known for this painting. But I think probably most people, even a lot of artists, don't know much of his work beyond this painting. I mean, obviously, if you're from Norway, you're probably sick and tired of of Edward Munch, you're like, oh, can't we find somebody else to talk about? In the same way that here in Canada, people are like, ah, oh, do we really have to talk about Emily Carr again? Ugh. I mean, that's what I hear all, I mean, which, you know, for some people are like, really? I loved Emily Carr. Look at that painting we did last week, or just a couple days ago. But the one thing I hear, even from my artist friends, is like, oh, not another Emily Carr show at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Ugh goodness <laughs> and I've said that myself um, because the space in that museum is quite limited but then um, not everybody uh, who goes to those museums is seeing you know most of those, like often people are seeing those paintings for the very first time they're visitors from out of town so it's nice to for them to see some of that work on permanent display after all the Vancouver Art Gallery, one of the reasons why they want to expand is they don't really have a space for exhibiting their permanent collection, which is actually amazing. They have an incredible collection of paintings, almost none of which are ever seen, ever. Barbara says, the drawing course really helped with my paintings, shading, perspective, proportion. I see so much more technical detail in paintings we study. Awesome. <laughs> Ari says, it's like a, I feel like a celebrity is pronouncing my name. I feel so privileged. <laughs> that is so funny. Enrico Jose says, hello from Brazil. Awesome. Hello, Enrico. Um, awesome. I love that. I love people from all over the world tuning in. Just blows my mind okay so what we got the yellow in we're gonna do the cool blue next and just again to reiterate basically all the quote-unquote rules or guidelines that I've talked about for the past few years are just completely out the door with this painting. Uh, we're using, uh, and that's, and it's something that Edward Munch did purposefully to to basically overturn the 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 to rebel against the older generation in Norway, as artists were doing, like Picasso, 
was doing and Matisse were doing in France, Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera were doing in Mexico. Um, there was a little bit less of that in Canada. Canada was about 15 years behind the times. Um, <clears throat> oh, look at that big blob of blue there. Um, but artists were, you know, really trying to, to suggest new ways of working. Okay. Again, that's what I love about having a little bit of glazing fluid in your paint is just go like undo. So I don't know what he's doing right here. <clears throat> This supporting beam of the railing, he's hasn't quite articulated as much as I am. I'm just gonna, you know, again, I'm not afraid of my painting diverging from the original a little bit, so.
Is that all the cool blue? Oh, there was a little area where I, like a few places where you put a bit of white in there. Another place. Okay. <clears throat> okay, some of that's still a little bit wet, but that's okay. Let's move on to our warm blue. I'm going to put a little bit of glazing fluid there just to make it a bit more transparent. And that warm blue is actually a little bit uh, slightly dirty. So I'm going to take a bit of warm, well, it's a bit too much warm red. Let's make it not quite. But you can see what that by adding that warm red to this that blue, it uh, kind of darkened it. <clears throat> and I'm also adding a bit of cool blue to this mixture because I think what he's using is probably not. I don't. Well, there might be ultramarine blue in there, but it's also probably a bit of like a, a cobalt blue, which is. Almost like a little bit in between our warm and blues. That gives me a nice dark blue. I think it might be a little bit too opaque though. So I'm just going to take that color, mix it in with my glazing food. Maybe take a bit more so it's not so transparent. And then I'll paint with this. And I can always go for a more opaque version of it as I go on my palette. Maybe I'll just start up here. Because he's definitely using some lighter 
um, maybe almost ultramarine blue back here. And then as he does get closer to the foreground, that color becomes darker. Which is, you know, a little bit more, goes back to a bit more of, it's closer to kind of the academic approach that he would have learned, where you're definitely putting your darker colors in the foreground. Like blacks really kind of want to exist right up close. So, you know, you know, he's kind of breaking the rules most places, but, you know, there's in some areas he's like, well, I don't want to go too far and not and make a painting that is just incomprehensible to people. I got to, you know, I have to Product of my time, I gotta build some recognizable elements in here. So I didn't even notice. So this is part of Oslo down here, and so some of those buildings and churches and things. This version, though, I, well, I guess maybe there's a little bit of stuff under here. Most of that is not visible. There are other versions where you see him really articulate that a lot more. Uh, let's let's go and paint these figures in the background. His friends back here. So you see, I'm not trying to be too precise with these brush strokes. I want to kind of keep it pretty loose, pretty wild. I 
which for some people comes very easy and for some people it is pretty hard to not fiddle endlessly with a painting Just as some paintings we've done require a lot of fiddling around, and for some people that's just like, oh my goodness, it's so much so difficult to drive me crazy. This area here is 
actually relatively, it's just kind of stained. Lots a bit of dry brush stuff going on. So getting there, obviously things are starting to, to darken down, getting more saturated colors. So I may even towards the, I mean, I thought it's interesting because I thought these reds when I was painting, I'm like, oh, that's a little too much. But because there was that glazing fluid in there and uh, they were a little bit more transparent and as they dried, the colors have sort of muted down a little bit, which I think is nice. I mean, because then I can always amp it up, dial it up a little bit more if needed. No, still not? Okay, I can... I'd rather have that opportunity to, to turn the dial up a little bit more as needed rather than to be like, whoa, that's too much. Whoa, okay, now I gotta... It's, I find it harder to... Well, it's not harder. It's just different. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely a philosophical difference between myself and maybe some other painters. I know some other painters will uh, kind of ex say, go, go to your darkest color and, and put that in first. Um, and I, there's, a, there's a certain amount of wisdom to that that I totally get. It makes some sense uh, because then you've got that, you've already established like the, the signpost of, of the darkest color. That makes a lot of sense. It's also, but I would, I prefer to kind of go start from the center and uh, like, excuse me, or a neutral color or the local color and then expand past that and then I've always got those extremes to work from um, but I, I think again it's I think it's important to know that there's not one official way to do it that if you've got a way to do it that works for you and until it stops working, it's the right way to, it's the perfect way for you. So now I'm taking my, my warm blue. I'm actually going to take a, put a bit of cool blue into this mixture. Ah, oh, sorry. Adding white, cool blue, warm blue. Because he's using...
some of this in the water. Now there, he does use pastel and crayon over top of almost everything later on. I don't know if I'm going to do that with this painting. I might just keep mine. I've already used some uh, pencil crayon in here. So I don't know if I want to do any more of that, but we'll see. Senga says, using pencil... <coughs> my goodness, why am I... Senga says, I'm using pencils and pastels for the first time. Yes, awesome. And Ari says, I, uh, I look at other people's paintings a lot. I love them, but I haven't posted mine to the Facebook group yet. Okay, I'm about to sneak. Or maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe I'm not about to sneeze. I guess. Uh, let's paint this um, cool red stripe over here. So once again, I'm just going to dirty it up a little bit. I actually think there's might even be a little bit of warm red in that color. Is that too dark? It appears a little bit dark right now. I think it's going to be fine. I, we still have a few layers of some of, to, to get this to be a bit darker. Now, again, there is kind of, you know, it's a line, but there's not a lot of precision in the way he's painted that line. I think, he again, he sees it as a guideline. You, you know that, I mean, obviously we could use tape to, to get this to be a little bit more... Um, to be straight or perfect if you want it. But, huh. Is that too much? Well, maybe I should have waited. Let's zoom in. Yeah, mine is definitely way more saturated his has got almost like a bit of a blood quality <clears throat> and it looks actually warmer than I expected it to be that's why I put a bit of warm red in there um, you know what I think I am just gonna wipe a bit of this away It's okay like that we'll, we'll come back to it when I get a little bit more darker values in there I might feel differently I might be like that needs to be much darker or maybe even a little bit of warm red on top of there uh, have we gone through the whole cycle of the painting So, so. 
So. Okay, I'm going to call this foreground pass number two. Uh, but really, this is ideally our f our final pass. So now we're kind of going over the layers of color that have already been established and adding some darker colors, kind of bring this painting into a little bit more focus. Mostly it appears like he's using just a darker warm blue to kind of add some darker outlines here. I might do a little bit of darker reds in some places. Um, and maybe even the first thing I should do probably is just to give a quick blow dry to this whole painting here. So. So let's let's put that back up again. So do we want to go more red? I'm not sure. I think his is more saturated than mine at the moment, or at least it appears that way. But it could also just be because I haven't got my darker values really in. I've got a lot of lighter colors, those yellows and reds, but we need some dark blues and even some browns, I think. And once I've got that in, it's going to be a little bit easier for me to evaluate the overall painting. So, you know, I, I just, I, and I think that's really important for people to know, like, that, you know, if you're looking at your painting and it's like, I don't know if that's too dark or too light, you're, you're, you're not, you know, stupid, you're not incompetent, you're not... Um, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just that, you know, it, it's, it's like you're trying to play chess with someone that is capable of playing like 10 steps ahead of you. I, I love playing chess, but I'm like, maybe, generally I'm just, I'm at that point that I'm on the step I'm at right now, right? I'm not four or five moves, 10 moves, 30 moves ahead like some grandmaster, right? So, some of you might be incredible painters like that who can kind of visualize what the painting's going to look like way down the line. I need to see it develop before I can make those decisions. And so right now I'm going to put in those darker colors. So I'm probably going to start in around here, maybe with these figures, work my way to the foreground. Saying I had to take a, a break to get a bite to eat. Sounds good. I, I'm, I'm getting a little hungry too, so um, let's bring this painting back here. Let's go. Let's go to the figures, I think. Okay, so let's go to our darker color that we mixed up. So this is basically a, a warm blue with um, a little bit of warm red in there and even a bit of, of cool blue. keep them a little bit ambiguous. I 
I mean, I like that, you know, they're so barely defined here that, you, you know, is this a, a woman with a dress here? What, like, exactly what am I looking at here? Boats. Back to the background up here.
So I'm, I'm also going to continue darkening these a little bit afterwards, a little bit of black. Well, well, yeah, a little, well, I think a really dark, dark blue. I'll make a black mix blue into it. taking a bit of that glazing fluid
<clears throat> okay. <laughs> Lolly says, how's the painting going, Ari? You keeping up? Okay, just cleaning my brushes a little bit because I've been I've been painting with them for a couple of hours and they start to get a little gummy. Okay, so I gotta pick my daughter up in 50 minutes, so I need to wrap up soon. Let's mix a brown now. We're gonna, I think it's what looks like a warm brown that he's using. <clears throat> so here's our, let's mix, we'll make a bigger batch. Let's take some warm yellow. Oh, that's my cool yellow. Well, let's just do this over here. We'll just cool, sorry, warm yellow, warm red. I want a bit more of a Start with more yellow. We'll add uh, and then some blue to this to make a darker brown. Now, the more blue we put in there, as well as the more red, the darker this brown is going to become. I think this is going to change this painting a lot because right now we've got a lot of bright colors what almost like a pr primary color we've got red yellow and blue basically here and <clears throat> beautiful colors but they're also you know it's not uh um they're they're totally dominating the paintings they're the only things in this painting at the at the present moment so once we start putting a bit of brown in here um, it's going to darken the painting, but it's also going to actually allow those bright colors to really shine independently. So right now they're, they're just, you know, they're, that's all there is. So let's, let's look at the original to see where the brown actually is, how much of it we have. I think mostly the brown is in the figure, well, on the railing predominantly, in the figure, little bits, a few other places. Um, so, let's dive that down. I'm going to put a bit of glazing fluid in here because I don't want to completely obliterate the colors that I spent time painting underneath the brown.
Wow, this is like almost instantly transforming this painting. Okay, I kind of like that. Okay, so what I... Ooh! I just got my sleeve went all over the bottom of the paint in here. I created some smears and smudges. Which is kind of in line with, if you look closely at his painting, there's all sorts of stuff. We'll talk about the wax, the wax splatter and even the words that he wrote right in the sky here shortly. <clears throat> but let's just kind of zoom back out so you can see how that brown transforms things. It right, gives a lot more structure to the painting. It brings the railing out. So I think what I want to do, I'm going to glaze, I'm going to blow dry this, and I think I'm going to do a little bit of glazing with a very light brown over a bunch of this painting, because it's a little bit too white.
Uh, Lolly says, does anyone here use oil paints at all? Could anyone answer a question for me? Do oils have a different texture to acrylics? Is it easier to build texture or the same as acrylics? Is there medium to add? And as in, is there a medium to add thickness? Like is there with acrylic paint mediums, heavy gel, etc.? Um, when it comes to, um, it's a different animal altogether. Um, it's a different, I mean, in some ways oil paint is in simpler than acrylic because there's generally less extra materials, all these other like you go to your art supply store and you look at the acrylics, there's just a whole wall of mediums. And it's like, oh my goodness, which one do I get? There's like, there's a, there's, they literally make a different medium for virtually every kind of imaginable scenario that you could possibly make, use a medium for. And I really think probably half of them are the same chemical, just repackaged with a different label. <clears throat> but, um... Whereas the oil paint section, you, you usually just see the colors and um, like the maybe turpentine and linseed oil. Um, generally, artists like the, the great thing with oil paint is because it's oil based. Um, when you put oil paint onto a surface, if you let it, if you just and you just walk away, like you could squeeze it out of the tube let it it's going to take like six months to dry but it will basically maintain its the 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 its mass this thickness in from the moment it comes out of the tube to the moment it dries it's not going to shrink down like acrylic paint does like if i squeeze acrylic paint out of the tube it's probably going to shrink down by about half um depending on the brand and all that kind of stuff it comes right out of the tube because it's water based and for it to dry that water has to evaporate that's why we add things to acrylic paint to thicken it um, uh, versus oil paint it'll stay you really don't need to add anything to thicken it although artists have done artists like Edvard Munch himself would literally use sand he used his own hair at times to build texture um, to get a kind of a gritty kind of uh, odd textures in his paint. So he, he's, uh, I was watching an interview with a, a conservator who was just talking about like some of his stuff just driving me crazy because there's just so many weird things that he did with his paint. And then we talked about when his biography, maybe towards the very end there, how he would take his canvases to the beach and set up on the beach and paint outside he he had his his studio was outside kind of like an open air barn where the horses would come and eat hay and he would paint there in the summer and in the middle of winter when it was pouring rain and these canvases would just get soaked with water and snow and um, so you imagine like bugs and dirt and hay and all sorts of things winding up on the surface of those paintings. It caused many of those paintings to rot, um, get all sorts of bacteria all over them. I mean, he's kind of like a, a conservator's worst nightmare. I mean, he really um, pushed the, the boundaries of you know what you might want to do to a canvas. Um, <laughs> so, you can you can put anything in oil paint or well you can put anything in oil paint except water although having said that i have seen people mix um uh, mix things like water into oil paint um it's definitely super unconventional uh and i i don't know exactly the what results from that i mean you're basically trying to to disturb the paint when you're when you're working in that way okay so what i'm doing just so that i um I, I mixed a little bit of my glazing fluid into some brown and now i'm just painting over i'm just gonna paint over really the whole painting with this color it's just 
darkening the picture a little bit. Mostly, it's like I'm I'm trying to make the cardboard in behind just a little bit darker. Make the painting overall. It's kind of nice. I don't, it probably is not even perceptible on camera. Um, but it's for visually for me, it's, it's made a big difference here. So I just, I took my glazing fluid. And yeah, that's better. It looks, I may even do a second coat in a few places. Or maybe not. Maybe that's good enough. Let's blow dry that though. Um, Ah, there's Abdullah says, hello, sir. How's your day going? Very good. And especially now that you're here with us today, Abdullah. I hope you're doing well. How is your day going? Uh, Ari says, my worst enemy these days is dust. Any advice on how not to get it into your brushes and your paintings? It drives me crazy. The house I'm currently in is old and messy and might be the issue. Uh, oh, and Alex says, hello from Austin, Texas. I just finished the first lesson of your drawing series, and I'm so excited to keep going. Awesome job, Alex. Keep on going. Yeah, don't give up. Join the Facebook group. Upload your work next um, Thursday. Basically, this time next week, I'm, I'm doing a feedback episode, and it's really focusing a lot on drawing. So if you get your drawings in the Facebook group, I'll give you some feedback on those. Hari and... Dust. Okay, let me think about that while I um, mix a, a paint here. Uh, just what I want to do, I want to get a bit of greenish quality on the face and maybe a few other places. Now that I got that brown in there, I felt that really helped. What kind of green is that? I think that's like a it's a warm green. It's just that might be a little bit too. It's okay. As for dust, well, the good thing with acrylic paint is it dries quickly. So if you do have a dusty environment, acrylic paint is by is way better friend of yours than oil paint because oil paint takes a long time to dry. So if you've got a dusty environment, oil paint is gonna, or the dust is gonna settle on that oil 
and it's going to drive you bonkers. Um, uh, with it comes to acrylic, um, gosh, how would you, uh, well, you could get a, what do they call those machines? I actually have one in the bedroom upstairs that helps um, kind of remove particulates and dust from the air. Uh, so you could do that in your studio space, put it kind of close to your, your painting your paint materials to try to suck out some of that air. Uh, probably a good idea not to have a fan on, because that fan is going to kick up any dust that's in the house. Um, I mean, worse comes to worse, you could literally put plastic up and have a space that is sort of protected from, um, uh, from dust settling in that area. Like, you put some plastic up, vacuum it all inside, Dust, I mean, plastic going right up to the ceilings. you got sort of like your, if you remember E.T., the extraterrestrial, remember that kind of bio lab they set up in the kid's house? That would be kind of like, that would be kind of what you're, you're talking about doing, or what I'm talking about, what you might want to do. Um, I'm just going to mix a black here, taking my cool blue, cool yellow, and warm red, a mix of black. Okay, it's a little on the brownish side, means I need to add some blue to it, maybe a bit more yellow. Gosh, you know what, let's just make a bigger batch of this, Michael. Why am I making this little thin mixture here? But like I was just talking about um, Edvard Munch, he's painting outside where, I mean, it's just a... And all sorts of things are getting mixed into the paint. So, I mean, you could... You can try to fight it if you've got a, a space that is just driving you crazy with dust. Or you can be like Edvard Munch and just go in the opposite direction, just let it get completely um, out of control. Um, okay, so let's, uh, I gotta, gotta kick on the jets here. Ideally wrap up here in about 15 minutes. Okay, um, oh, what else, uh, 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 Lolly says, Ari, I understand what you mean, dog hair is such a nuisance when it comes to my paintings, I don't have a great solution, but I keep, have a fabric roll I wrap um, my brushes in, which keeps them clean between uses, that's smart, Ari says, I also keep brushes in a case, but during the painting process, especially when doing backgrounds, I see tiny hairs appearing all the time, I might use paint retarder to take the time to remove them. That's true. Also, potentially just letting them dry. Often I find, especially if you're painting thin, once they dry, you can kind of pick those things out. As opposed to when they're wet, you try to pick them out, and they just you see your fingernail scratches in there. Um, it's, it could also be the brushes themselves. If you're using really cheap brushes... The brushes are going to fall apart and hairs come off the brushes. So make sure it's it's not your own hair or your pet's hair. Um, that it's or that it's not your paint brushes themselves that are falling apart. Or you know it's not even just cheap brushes. But if you've been using a brush for a while, 
you know, they start to break down. Like, all of these brushes, as they, you know, they start to, to little pieces of them, just like our own hair, starts to, to kind of, you know, break apart. And that can cause havoc, for sure. Okay. Um, I'm going to take my uh, warm blue and bring a bunch of black into that warm blue. I don't really see black in the original painting anywhere. So it's just a really dark blue. Um, so I want to want to make sure that I'm uh, cuz black is a is a intense color. And if we just sort of start using it all over the place, it's just going to kind of it's not going to fit in. It doesn't play well with others. All right, so.
Okay, I want to get this green in here next. Take my uh, cool blue, cool yellow. So this is without any fluid at all. It's big, thick mixture of paint. Definitely different than what he would have applied here. Just adding a bit more line work in here. Just gonna import a bit of that green. Take a bit of my cool yellow, a bit of that green, and this could be a bad idea, but let's uh, let put it in this face. See how much darker his is than mine. Just that darker brown makes the painting overall just much more dull. Okay, I'm going to come back with my warm red. Let's add a bit of glazing fluid in there just to, so it's not too intense. And I feel it's going to bring a bit more of this more saturated red.
That looks nice. It complements the dark blues quite well. Okay, I'm getting close. Now there, he's has used um, this pastel to draw around on there. Um, hmm. I don't think that's something. Oops. Splattered water. Did that get all over? Nope. I don't think so. I'm gonna come back with. Take my black, darken the figure even more here. And I think I'm also going to take a little bit of my warm red and put it back over the side of the painting here, even though, you know, I said cool red, but I just feel like it actually wants to be a bit cool, a bit warmer. Hmm, maybe it needs a bit of black in there. Um, I think that's pretty good. Let's blow dry it.
Okay. Now, there are a few things with this painting that I didn't do, but I'm out of time. Uh, so, I will... I still want to do the other uh, one that I started here with pastel. So, I think I'm going to... Uh, wrap up here and we'll, we'll just look at these paintings as they are okay so we're at the end of the episode there's again a few things I want to do to uh, this painting that but I don't have time I gotta run and pick my daughter up from school uh, so in a future episode when I do the other Edward Munch um, pastel artwork I'll come back and add those here because there's, there's stuff I want to talk about that I think is really interesting and unique about this particular painting. So we'll kind of fold those two in together. So um, just before we, we compare these artworks, just a reminder to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. 70% of the people that watch these videos on this channel are not subscribers. There's like, you know, about 20,000 people a week watch these videos. And if only a thousand of those people hit the subscribe button, that would change my life overnight, right? So um, also, if you want to support the channel with a small donation, consider using the PayPal link down below. While we're live, you can use the YouTube Super Chat to donate directly through YouTube. Or if you want to send an uh, e-transfer or check in the mail, my email is on my own website um, and the Facebook group. So all those links are down below. You can contact me through there. Take a photograph of whatever you've created, upload it to our Facebook group, which if you haven't done so by now, here's some encouragement to do so. Join the Facebook group. This time next week, we're going to do a free feedback episode. Um, and so... If you're just joining us now, here's an opportunity to get right in. Sometimes it takes me a couple of months to get to these things. So um, you'd be lucky to kind of get in now while the, the grass is green. Uh, for you anyway, it's, it's cold and wet out here in Vancouver. But um, so here's the original. And then mine is... Whoa, ah much brighter okay it does look brighter on camera than it does in person i think mine is a little bit closer to the original uh i do bump up the the saturation and the well not the saturation so much but the the brightness of the camera just so you can see all the details which otherwise might just look black um so uh yeah um, I like how this turned out. It was fun painting with in this style, uh, using his technique. Uh, I feel like, oh man, as I look at it, there's, I feel like this needs to get a little bit darker under here. Some areas, just kind of, I don't know, that blue should kind of continue in. There's, there's problems with my artwork for sure. So if you're watching this for the first time, you're like, hey, you got a lot of stuff wrong, buddy. Uh, you're certainly welcome to leave that comment down below, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, aware, pretty well aware of some of these things. A little bit of... Um, I was diddly-daddling in, in some of the earlier layers of the paint just because I don't usually use that technique often. So let's just uh, zoom in. Maybe we'll start up here in the sky. Uh, it's hard to see. We'll talk about this in the next episode, but there's some words written in here. We'll talk about what all that means, and I'll literally write it into the canvas um, on my version as well. But just for now, just looking at the application of colors. <sighs> yeah, it looks like he's probably used like a, a white pastel. We can see that white pastel down there. Maybe he even drew it out. Now that I think about it, Maybe he drew it with pastel first and then painted over the pastel. That's, you know, I'm, you know, now that I think about it, that's, well, that pastel certainly looks like it was done on top of things. So I don't know. He probably did a little bit of both. Maybe drew it out 
the reason I say he painted over is this looks like it's a white pastel with red paint over top of it, kind of a bit of a resist happening. Um, let's go to the other side here. I mean, I, still, I think I could still darken this strip, make it a little bit more on the brown side than it currently is, but because his looks a little bit more like coagulated blood or something, whereas mine is a little bit... Mm, it looks like halfway between blood and licorice. <laughs> a sentence I have never said before, probably won't ever say again, but... Um, let's scroll down. Yeah, now, the more I look at it, the more I feel like, yeah, maybe there's some need to put pastel or something in there because it is such a you know part important part of this painting uh, there's also the splatter of wax on there which has a whole other story too that i didn't get a chance to talk about so um that splatter that was one of the ways that they used to identify this painting when it was recovered after having been stolen and during the Winter Olympics opening ceremony in Lillehammer in 94. Uh, yeah, some of this I kind of maybe articulated that this post, which you see he really barely hinted at here. I, I did that because I felt like in my own painting I needed some extra structure there. Uh, some of these colors, I, there's, it's missing some orange. That's one thing that this painting is missing. Now, that's probably just the colors when he was painting that they, they were mixing together, wet on wet. Um, let's go over here. So as I was painting, I was kind of doing some glazing, just darkening in this area. And I really could have kept going and going and going. Uh, but I don't mind it like that either. I actually kind of like this little rough patch of texture. I think that's kind of cool, actually. The figures back there. Uh, they're okay. I, I do like the his feel a little bit more ghostly than mine. Mine just feel a little bit lazily painted, I guess you might say. Whereas his just feel like they're fading into the background. Um, which is one thing that's unique about this version of the painting than uh, the other ones. Is I think the other ones, the figures tend to, to be a little bit um, more defined. And then, uh, well, let's start at the bottom of the figure, work our way up. You know, this, uh, the blue on camera is definitely appears more warm and more saturated than it actually is in person. But it is, the whole painting overall is definitely more saturated anyway. But, um, so if you're like, wow, that's really blue. Well, it is bluer in person, but maybe not quite as blue as that. Uh, and then the face of the figure. I, I, I Again, I like how mine turned out. It looks, at least on my TV, preview TV going out uh, to the web, looks a little bit more greenish than it actually is. But again, there's those little um, pastel lines that he's drawn all over the, there that um, uh, kind of lighten it up a little bit and take away from some of the green. I don't know. I, overall, I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. I know it's not exactly the same as as really none of these paintings are. Um, but this definitely inspires me to do a lot more. Uh, well, not a lot more, but a few more Edvard Munch paintings. Um, yeah, you know, even the way I did the hands, these just look like. You know, they, they, they don't even, we don't see the, the palms of the hands pressing into his cheeks there. They just seem kind of like flippers or something, right? So, you know, the, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where it's a simple painting, but 
that also makes when you diverge from that simplicity those things tend to be become more apparent right Either way, I think for right now, I can live with this. I'll, I'll be I'll be more than happy with that. Okay, everybody. Well, thanks for painting along with me today. Um, I hope you have a wonderful afternoon and or morning, night, wherever you are on our beautiful planet. You're doing the world a major solid here by making paintings. So I hope you continue to spread your love of art with your community, with the world. The more people who are making art, the better, more peaceful world we are going to have. We'll see you again next episode. Have a great night, everybody. Bye-bye.